So if you've got your Bibles, I want to invite you to go to Acts 18. Uh, we are in the book of Acts this morning. Um, and a couple questions as you're turning there uh, to Acts 18. Do you know your gifts? Do you know your gifts? And maybe a, a better question, or at least as important of a question, are you actually using your gifts? Because if you just know your gifts, but you're not using your gifts, you're not very worth, uh, it's not really worth much, is it? Last weekend, uh, we had a guest here uh, at Faith, and uh, I met with her this week, and we gave her one of these books, and um, so we were meeting this past week, and she said, yeah, I got into this already, and I've already taken the online assessment, and I'm just kind of tearing into this, and I thought, wow, uh, she takes this whole thing about uh, learning about your gifts really seriously. Uh, and I think that's really, really important for us uh, to, to learn our gifts, to discover our gifts, and then put our gifts into action. Pablo Picasso, one of the greatest artists of the 20th century, he was that guy uh, who was kind of out on the periphery, out on the edge, always kind of pushing the envelope, trying to encourage the world uh, to experience uh, a little bit more. He's the guy who kind of developed this idea, one of the co-founders of cubism or collage art. And uh, so one of these, you know, a great artist, this is what he says, the meaning of life is to find your gift and the purpose of your life is to give it away. Not just know your gift, but truly give it away. And Pastor Don Everts in his book, he writes this, we are told in the pages of the Bible that God not only sees everyone, that's a typo, everyone is a gift, but also sees them as having gifts to share in a personal way. The Apostle Paul says it this way, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Let's not just know about them, but let us put them into action. And this morning, we're going to look at a, a couple who not only knew their gifts, but used their gifts uh, to serve in the world, Aquila and Priscilla. And here we are 2,000 years later, and we continue to look at their lives and really consider how the ways in which they use their gifts continue to impact all of us today. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord for a new day, for a time to gather together, to worship you, to serve you, to listen to you, to come before you, to read your word, and to reflect what this might have to say to us today. And so God, I pray that the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. You are indeed our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, history and fiction are filled uh, with all sorts of people uh, who uh, were dynamic duos, I guess, if you will. Power couples, even. I think about people like uh, Romeo and Juliet. I think about Sonny and Cher. I think about Batman and Robin, people who in their own right had extraordinary gifts. And when they came together we're really able to accomplish something really significant in the world. And the Bible also has many power couples that we read about, people like Abraham and Sarah, Moses and Zipporah. I think about uh, Ruth and Boaz, these power couples that were serving in ministry together and did so much good. And Priscilla and Aquila, or Aquila and Priscilla, are another power couple that show up in uh, the Bible, in the New Testament. And you probably know the names Aquila and Priscilla. You've heard these names before. I know many of you have read the Bible before, but you're like, yeah, they seem kind of obscure. We really don't know much about them. And let's be honest, they kind of sound like a Dr. Seuss book, right? Priscilla and Aquila and their vanilla gorilla were drinking sarsaparilla on their way to Manila. I mean, that's kind of what it sounds like, right? It's, they're just like, what? Who is this couple? But there were some really important people in the life of the early church. And yes, their names rhymed for sure. But the Bible hints at and tells us that if it weren't for their lives, the church could have gone in a very different direction. 
because they provided at the right place in the right time and they used their gifts to serve a guy who you know, the Apostle Paul. And so we're going to look at Priscilla, Aquila this morning and really kind of consider what their lives might mean for us today. Now they show up six different times in the New Testament, in four different books of the New Testament. They show up in Acts, what we're going to read about in just a moment. They show up in Romans, they show up in 1 Corinthians, and they show up in 2 Timothy. And one of the interesting things about Aquila and Priscilla that we're going to read about uh, this morning is that oftentimes Priscilla's name shows up first. And that's pretty unusual in Scripture. And we've talked about this several times because women didn't play as prominent of a role in ancient times. In fact, they didn't have much power at all. And, and the fact that over and over the Apostle Paul writes Priscilla and Aquila, woman's name first, tells us something about her. That she was likely someone of power, someone of prominence. Maybe she came at a background where her, her family was very wealthy or certainly uh, had, uh, came from a place of, of privilege and power. Some biblical scholars even suggest that it was Priscilla who wrote the New Testament book of Hebrews. There's all sorts of speculation about who wrote Hebrews, because it's a very interesting literary style if you've ever read Hebrews before. And some people say, I think it was Priscilla because of her educated background. But because she was a woman, she can't actually put her name you know, in the book of Hebrews. Now, we don't know that Priscilla wrote the book of Hebrews. We don't know. Scholars don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. I'm just saying, that's who she was. And I kind of want to paint that picture for you. There's something unusual, something different about her. And we first meet uh, Aquila and Priscilla first in Acts 18. And the Apostle Paul is on his second missionary journey. And so I'm going to invite us to read Acts 18, beginning with verse 1 this morning. After this, the Apostle Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native Pontus, which is kind of in the uh, northeastern corner of Turkey today, kind of on the uh, Black Sea there, uh, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them. And because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. And so in just these few verses, we learn several little nuggets about Aquila and Priscilla. And the first thing we learn is uh, they uh, got kicked out of Rome. He was a Jew. And the, the, the emperor there, Claudius, he was trying to get rid of all the Jews, so he kicked them all out. And so they ended up in a place called Corinth. And that's where they're at. And as, so as they're setting up shop, the Apostle Paul is working his way around the Mediterranean. Of course, he starts in Jerusalem, then he went over to Athens, and he's, he's moving around, and he shows up, and there they are welcoming him in. Paul, the Apostle Paul, and Aquila and Priscilla, they became great friends, we learn throughout Scripture. They became partners in ministry. That's how Paul refers to them in Scripture, as partners in ministry. And they traveled together, and they planted churches. We also learn uh, that they were in the tent-making business. They made tents, and so did Paul. So somehow, we don't know how Paul and Aquila and Priscilla found each other in the city of Corinth, and they became friends and church planters together. Later, we learn that Paul says, hey, I got to keep on this missionary journey. You guys want to come to Ephesus with me? And they're like, sure. So they picked up and they moved to Ephesus, a whole other area, and they planted another church there. And so they're planting a church there. Paul says, I got to keep moving. Can you guys stay here and kind of hold down the fort? I'm going to keep going on my missionary journey. And so Aquila and Priscilla agree to stay, this time in Ephesus. And so they're taking care and, and growing and planting and, and making disciples and working in that community. And one of the other people they meet, another church planter, is a guy by the name of Apollos. And he was also a leader in the church. He was actually a pretty prominent leader. 
And he was preaching and teaching about this kind of old school idea. They call, the, they call it the, the John the Baptist school of, of baptism. So they pull him aside and then they say to him, hey, your theology is a little off. And they very gently correct him in his theology as it relates to baptism. Not just being baptized for the forgiveness of sin, but also being baptized in the presence of the Spirit. So that's what's going on in Ephesus as they plant a second church. Later on, we also learn that they are able to go back to Rome, where Aquila is originally from. And they plant yet another church there. This time it's a house church. And for about 10 years, there they are in Rome, opening up their home and welcoming people in for yet another church plant. This is their third church plant. Sometimes people ask, ask me, why do you guys plant churches? Because that's what they did in the Bible. And we just want to do what they're doing in the Bible. They would travel around, grow disciples of Jesus Christ, make disciples, invite people into a relationship with Jesus, plant churches, and just keep going and going and going. And this is what Paul and Aquila and Priscilla were doing. Now in 64 AD, there was a fire in Rome. And what many scholars believe is Aquila and Priscilla, their house was involved in this fire. So all of a sudden, they lose their house. And they leave. And they go back to Ephesus. They travel around and support yet this uh, church plant that they were a part of uh, earlier. We also learn later on that the Apostle Paul, when he was in Rome, in prison, writing a letter to his protege, Timothy. We know this letter as 2 Timothy. In that letter, he references Aquila and Priscilla again. And he thanks them for sticking their necks out. Something they did, and, and the Bible doesn't tell us exactly, but they were very courageous they were willing to go uh, toe the line and, and really help Paul out when he was in a jam. He says, hey, greet Aquila and Priscilla, the, that couple who really stuck their neck out for me. That really meant a lot for me. Well, the Apostle Paul was executed in Rome uh, around the time. That was the last letter he wrote, 2 Timothy. And after he wrote that letter, an Aquila and a Priscilla continued on in their ministry. So they, they continued to grow disciples and plant churches uh, in the early church. And so uh, that's their journey. They moved around a lot. And I know some of you have moved around a lot. I know our family has moved around a lot. So I, really, I, I, I can relate to Aquila and Priscilla. And sometimes they would move around because people like the Apostle Paul would show up and say, hey, come plant this church with me. Other times they moved around because they lost their home. They're just like, ah, circumstances, we got to go. And some of you I know have made it to Bloomington Normal because there was a, a job opportunity here for you or, or family or kids or schooling or something like that. And you came here uh, for some reason. You weren't planning on coming here. Others of you are townies. You grew up here. You've stayed here. We'll probably do your funeral here. That's okay too. That wasn't Aquila and Priscilla. They moved around a lot, growing disciples and planting churches. Just kind of wanted to paint that picture for you to get a little bit better idea who they were. I think more importantly, not about just their journey, but it's how they used their gifts. Aquila and Priscilla knew their gifts, and they used their gifts. They shared their gifts with others around them. And one of the first things we learn about, just in these few short verses, is that they have the gift of hospitality. This idea of welcoming the stranger. Remember, they were already in Corinth when the Apostle Paul showed up. They were doing what they do with their uh, tent maker business. Paul shows up. Somehow, uh, they meet one another. They open their home. They invite him in. And they work together. They kind of help him get on his feet. And those of you who have read the Bible and studied the Bible, you know when you hear this word Corinth, you're like, oh, it was Corinth. Corinth... Whenever we hear the word Corinth, what the book of 1st and 2nd Corinthians, we should immediately think, oh, Las Vegas. Corinth was that place of great temptation. 
Corinth had a reputation of, of temptations lying around every corner. There were lots and lots of gods that they worshipped in Corinth, which included child sacrifice, temple prostitution. There was a lot of shady stuff that went on in Corinth. It was not a safe place for a Christ follower to go. And so as Paul is making his way to Corinth, that's the, the place where he's going. He's going into this place where there's lots of temptation, a lot of things that are, let's just say, not God-sanctioned going on in the city of Corinth. And so how fortuitous it was that as Paul shows up in this town to, to plant a church into this city, there's Aquila and Priscilla. Come on in, Paul. We want to welcome you, give you a place of safety, give you a place of a me share a meal, a place where you can kind of get on your feet and make tents like we do. So they've got this wonderful gift of hospitality. And hospitality is this gift where we just, we come in, we feel welcome into a place. We can kind of set down all the rat race of the world, your world and my world, and we can come into a place and just kind of <sighs> take a breath. And it's safe. And it's comfortable. And it feels warm. It feels friendly. We all appreciate people who have the gift of hospitality. And in many ways, this is why we've created these life groups or these life group environments. For all of us to come into a place twice a month, gather together with a group of people and just be in that safe place, that place where we can be ourselves, that place where we can just share what's going on in our lives and that place where we can hear what's going on in other people's lives. Because we all need a safe place. We all need a safe space from the temptations, the problems, the drama of the world, to just be together in relationship with one another. Frankly, this is also why we've created this early 30 on Sunday morning. So we can gather together and just kind of come into this place and just take a breath, rest, get a cup of coffee, get some treats, the early 30 is not about the coffee and the treats. But the early 30, it's nice to have coffee and treats, right? Where we can just relax a little bit and let the stress out of our bodies. Help us to reframe, to refocus, to prepare our hearts, our minds for worship. We think this is just really important for us to be in relationship and community, to, to experience this place of welcome and hospitality. We're not a big church. We're not this church that people can just walk into and kind of blend in. I've had people tell me, I'm not going to your church. I want to find a church where I can just sneak in. Nobody knows me. I can just blend in. I can kind of just do my thing and then leave at the end of the worship service. We're not that church. You know that, right? I mean, if there are guests who come into this place, everybody knows it. We all know it. This is a place, we, we are a smaller congregation, a, a smaller community. And when the guests walk into this place, we think it's really important that we provide hospitality. Because if you've ever been in an experience where you walk into a space, into a place, everybody's looking at you and it's like, oh, this is really uncomfortable. Many years ago, my wife and I lived in Thailand. And uh, we don't look very Thai, and so uh, as we would travel around, uh, we, and we lived in a small town. And one of the interesting things about living in a small town, they didn't see a lot of Westerners there. So we stuck out everywhere we went. And it was not uncommon for uh, Thai people uh, to come up to us as we're doing what we were doing and go, Farang, Farang, which in Thai means foreigner, foreigner. It was very awkward, very odd for people to just point at you and say, you're a foreigner, you're a foreigner. And, it, you know, we didn't really know what to do. And it was just this over and over, farang, farang. And after a while, we would just speak Thai back with them and they kind of dropped all of it. And they're like, oh, okay, they're okay with us. And it usually led to some kind of conversation. But when people come into Faith Lutheran Church, 
It's about that stark. It's about that, ah, they know I don't fit here. I don't belong here. These people are all talking to each other. And so when you come for the early 30, I want to encourage you to, to connect with one another. But when you see people who don't look like us, who you haven't seen before, go and introduce yourself to them. Go talk to them because that's going to help them to feel more comfortable. And this is why hospitality is so important. And this is the gift that uh, Aquila and Priscilla had. It's this idea of making and helping other people to feel comfortable. Aquila and uh, Priscilla, they were also tent makers. That was a gift they had. That was a skill they had. Now, when we think about tent makers today, it's just like we don't really have that anymore. I guess probably the closest thing might be home builders. They were in the construction industry. And in ancient times, uh, uh, tent makers, they would make tents uh, out of cloth, of course. It was made from like goat hair or sheep wool, and they would weave it together. But also they worked with, they were known as leather workers as well. And they had these, these very tangible, practical skills. And they, they, they were, tent makers were not known just for making tents, but they used these, these big pieces of cloth for lots of very practical purposes, like ships, uh, sails on ships, or just maybe like some kind of shade, some kind of awning over a house or a, a public building. So it was a, a very practical, tangible skill they had. And of course, they made money. This is how they took care of themselves, provided for themselves, fed themselves. And we think about this idea of tent makers today. I think uh, the, the people that come to my mind are Kendall and Emily Oliver. Now, I first met Emily Vallander 10 years ago, and she was somewhere between uh, high school and college. And we were on this youth uh, trip together, and we traveled to Atlanta, Georgia to go to the Passion Conference which is this gathering of 50,000 uh, college students and high school students. And I didn't know Emily, and she didn't know me, but we got to know each other on the van ride down. And during those several days of this uh, college uh, worship time together, we got to know one another, and I thought, she's all right. She's a faithful Jesus follower. And then after that, I didn't really see Emily for a few years. She showed up a couple of years later, married, kid in tow. In the, t in the course of time, Emily and Kendall gone to college, grad school, got some training. He became an architect and started working for his father's architecture firm in Decatur, Illinois, just down the road. When I first met them, met Kendall and Emily, they were sharing with me how they got jobs and working in the community, got involved in their church, volunteering. But they were also hosting a Bible study in their home. So I called them up one day and I said, hey, can I come over to your house? Can I bring pizza to your house and learn more about your Bible study? Because there's rumor that this Bible study is really something. So I remember going down uh, to Decatur with a pizza sitting in their dining room, just saying, hey, tell me about your Bible study. And they said, it's awesome. We've got all these young couples coming, lots of little kids. Our house is starting to get kind of small for all these people coming. I was blown away. See, I'd just been at a conference uh, not that long ago. It's called Exponential. I needed some training in uh, church planting. And one of the things that I learned at this church uh, planting conference the theme that year was called Hero Maker. And one of the things they learned, I learned at that conference, and some of you were even there with me, was this idea of speaking into other people. They say, we call I-C-N-U the four most important letters of the alphabet. We encourage everyone, you don't have to serve in any official capacity, to regularly tell others, I see this ability in you, I see this gift in you, and I see God at work in you. It's a simple formula that helps create a yes environment. All you have to do is say, I see blank in you. You fill in the blank, 
with appropriate affirmation. And so there I was, coming off of this conference, having pizza with Kendall and Emily. And I said, I see church planting in you. I'm going to test this out. They're like, really? We don't see that. I said, yeah, I think you should pray about that. In fact, would you be willing to come to Faith Lutheran and preach? Just give it a, give it a run. We're, we're a pretty friendly congregation here. We like to test things out here. So on March 8, 2020, that was the last Sunday live service here before we all got to go into COVID lockdown. Wasn't that fun? Kendall preached here. It was the first time he had ever preached in a church before. And they shared with me as they were driving back to Decatur, they felt God saying, yes, we need to plant a church in Decatur. I see in you. I think it's a wonderful, important idea for all of us to engage in. How we think about and encourage one another. And this is what it means for a tent maker to be in church planning. Kendall still works for this architecture firm during the week. Got a few more babies now, right, Jeff? Jeff? <laughs> and another one on the way. They're a busy family. Working during the week. Busy family. And yet on weekends, on Sunday morning, they are gathered together and Kendall is preaching before this uh, very noisy congregation. I've been down there a couple times. Kids everywhere. It's so exciting. It's so much fun. This is what a church planner looks like today. This is what a, a tent maker looks like today. And I talked to Kendall uh, about once a month. Uh, he and another pastor, another church planner. This guy's in Utah. We get on Zoom once a month and we, we do some check-in. We do some encouragement. I'm the old guy. And so I just kind of check in with him and say, hey, how are things going? And this other guy out in Utah, he's also a tent maker. He, he has a day job. And both of them say, hey, you know, the, the day job pays the bills. It gives us opportunity to uh, rub shoulders with other people in the community. And it helps us, it provides for us so that we can do ministry in our congregations. That was Aquila and Priscilla. And you just got to know this continues to go on today, time after time after time. And I want to encourage us to be thinking about how we are also tent makers, how we leverage our skills, how we leverage those things that God has given to us so that we can do ministry, both in our day jobs. It's called marketplace ministry. And also so that we can be serving here on Sunday morning, encouraging one another. So I'm going to close just by asking you a couple questions. What are your gifts? What are your God-given gifts? What has God shown you that he has given you, has offered you for you to serve him, to make disciples and to plant churches? Number two, how have you used your gifts in the past? How have you leveraged what God has given you? Remember what Picasso said. Your purpose is to give them away, to give away what God has given you to support the local church, to support the global church, to grow disciples and to plant churches. How has God used you? How might God use you? And number three, how are you encouraging others to discover their gifts? How are you gathering together, having conversation with other people, saying, hey, I see this gift in you. Have you ever thought about using that gift to serve Jesus, to make disciples, to plant churches, to grow the kingdom? And oftentimes I think we think about these things. We look at someone else's life and we think, oh, that person's really got this gift or that gift, but we don't actually say it. We don't actually speak it. And I think that's what's really uh, important is that we are intentional in speaking the, what we, uh, other people's gifts are or just saying, gosh, I see this in you. Do you see that you have this gift? And just kind of see how God and the Holy Spirit uses that to make disciples and to plant churches. You know, this is how Jesus did it with his own disciples. 
those guys that traveled with him. And I think about that day where he was teaching and preaching uh, out on the open plain and, and they're having this, you know, he's doing this wonderful thing and all of a sudden it's like, ooh, it's late in the day. What are we going to do? Everybody's hungry. Send him home. Jesus says, no, have him sit down. And Jesus takes bread and some fish. And this is what we read in Scripture in Matthew. So important. Matthew 14. And Jesus directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave it to the disciples. And the disciples gave it to the people. Jesus could have simply given the bread and the fish to the people, but he wanted to use his people, his own disciples. This is how Jesus did it over and over. He did things using his people in his midst, his disciples. And I think this is how Jesus continues to use us as the church today. He places things in our hands. Of course, we call these gifts, talents, skills. And he invites us to give them away and to share with others. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, that you are a God who wants to not only be in relationship with us, but that, God, you have gifted us. You have given us things, talents, skills to discover and to use to serve in this world. And so, God, as we continue on this journey, I pray, Lord, that you would just reveal yourself to us, speak to us. And God, help us to step out in boldness and with courage and intentionality to share our gifts with others around us that you might be glory, glorified and honored that as we grow disciples and plant churches, our gifts would just be affirmed. God, you're using us to bring you honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer.